Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, third session on uh, uh, the series on the theology of prayer, which is the seventh session on the, the bigger series on uh, spiritual disciplines. So I hope you've been uh, blessed so far by uh, uh, by the simple things that we've been sharing. And so this morning I want to continue. Uh, I I do not have time to go back over what was said in the previous session because there is so much to say in this one and we want to keep these sessions uh, short you know and uh, so i want to uh this morning I, I i want us to discuss i want to discuss the prayer life of jesus this is the second part on the prayer life of jesus which i began to discuss in the previous session and in the previous session i, I focused on uh, the constant fellowship that Jesus enjoyed with the Father. And one of the things that I said was that you cannot enjoy that kind of constant fellowship. You cannot have a constant fellowship with God if you don't learn to have moments with God. You know, I said Jesus had a prayer life. His prayer life was really a prayer life, not just prayer moments. But I also said, I balanced this by saying that if you don't learn to have prayer moments, you cannot have a prayer life. You can't have the, the praying without ceasing experience, if you don't learn to have the, the you know, the, the, the punctual, organized kind of prayer experience. If you don't learn to have prayer moments, meaning specific times of prayer that you set yourself apart from other people and you stay alone with God, you know, and you do this habitually. If you don't learn to do this, uh, it will be very difficult. I, I don't want to say impossible, but it will be very difficult for you to have this uh, kind of fellowship with God and constant communion with the Father that Jesus enjoyed while, I was, while He was on earth. Another key ingredient to this uh, consistency and constancy of uh, a fellowship with the Father in Jesus' life was His obedience. His obedience. He said, I only do what the Father, uh, what I see the Father do. That was the key to, to Jesus' constant state of communion with God. You cannot be in continual communion with the Father if you don't learn obedience. Because sometimes the Father, through the Holy Spirit, will prompt you to do some things. He will sometimes call you. He will beckon you. He will, he will sometimes inspire you to do something or to say something. And if we don't learn to obey these promptings, to obey, if we don't learn to follow these leads, you know, these leadings, and uh, obey these promptings, we will break fellowship. We will limit our ability to fellowship with God. Okay? It's just like you cannot uh, have constant conversation with somebody that whenever the person speaks, you do the opposite of what the person said. Whenever the person invites you, you don't come. Because, see, Jesus, uh, the, the Father wants us to be in this constant kind of fellowship with Him. The Spirit of God wants us to be in this kind of constant fellowship with Him. But... We do not respond positively to, to his promptings and, and to his invitations. And like I said in the very first session on this uh, Theology of Prayer series, God is with us, but we are not with him. You know, and praying, prayer is learning to pay attention to him. And, and the more we learn to be attentive, the more we pay attention, the greater and the deeper and the more constant our fellowship with him will be. Okay, so that's that's as far as I can go back on the previous things that have been said. So, uh, rapidly, I want to dive into what we want to share this morning. I want to look at how Jesus really prayed, how he organized his life, in addition to the constant communion that he enjoyed with the Father. How were his prayer moments, his moments, his moments? We're going to look at a couple of of scriptures, I believe um, we're going to look at many scriptures, not too many, but quite a few, and we'll just read them. I'll read them to you, and uh, and uh, we'll try to see what we can learn, what what lessons we can draw from uh, what scripture says about Jesus' prayer life. All right, so let's start with Hebrews chapter five and verse seven. The Bible says in this scripture, in this portion of scripture, during the days of of his life on earth, talking about Jesus. He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard. 
because of his reverent submission. He was heard because of his reverent submission. Now, uh, 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 there, there are so many things that we can learn from, from this passage. But concerning the prayer life of Jesus, the Bible says here that during his days on earth. Now, this scripture has a context. And the context here is provided by what follows up next. You know, it says... Uh, petitions and loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. Okay, so we understand that this scripture was, it most specifically, it may more specifically apply to the context of, of his passion. You know, you remember the prayer that Jesus prayed and he said he asked the Father to take this cup away and things like that. But then he, but then he concluded, but not my will, but yours be done. I, I, I want to believe that this scripture does not just apply to that one instant because we don't know every detail of Jesus' life on earth. So I want to believe, and I believe that scripture substantiates this. This was not just a one-time event. It was, it was a pattern in the life of Jesus. Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. Uh, the, the, the King James Version uses the, the word supplications. And this... Uh, once this leads me to say something here, right here, I, I, I'm, I could have said this later on, but I can just say it here. Uh, offered up prayers with loud cries and tears. You know, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Now, this shows me one thing. Prayer was not always an easy thing. It wasn't always a convenient thing. There, there, there are different kinds of prayer. Maybe we'll address this in more depth in another session. But all prayer cannot just be, you know, confessions of faith and things like that. I do not know one believer who really grows by that kind of prayer, you know, and who really grows in, in, in the manifestation and realization of God's power in their life by that, by that kind of prayer. You don't, prayer is not always convenient. Prayer is not always uh, conversational. Prayer is not always just a sweet fellowship, you know, with the Father. You know, I, I enjoy just being in the presence of God and, you know, just talking, relaxing, because prayer is not fight all the time. But my point here is uh, prayer is not fight all the time. But sometimes prayer is not just that easy thing. You know, the smiling thing. There is also crying in prayer. There are also tears in prayer. And I want to believe that somebody who has never, who does not know tears in prayer, I am so convinced in my spirit that you don't really know. There are many things that you've never experienced with God and that you maybe will never experience with God. Okay, because you you may not need to come to the point of tears in prayers and loud cries and things like that you know, supplications, when it's only about your life. But whenever you have to begin to, you know, to share in the burden of somebody else, prayer cannot be convenient. You can't just confess that the next person to you is going to, you know, to make it in life or is going to be saved, okay? Confession doesn't work for certain things. Certain things require really asking God, supplication, you know, and, and saying, Father, I beseech you, oh, Father, do this. Not because the Father does not want to do it, but because that's the pattern that he has established. Jesus knew what it meant to, to, uh, to labor. Now, the Apostle Paul said, I labor, I labor, I labor. I feel the, 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 the birth pains, the pains of, of, of labor like a mother who's about to give birth, until you, until Christ is formed in you. So Paul is saying that his prayer life for the saints, his prayer for the saints, maybe his prayer for himself was, you know, was the very easy kind of, of stuff, you know, because actually when I pray for myself, I'm not stressed up. But when I have to begin to pray for God's interest on the earth, sometimes it is with tears, sometimes it is with, with crying, and um, you know when when you see the sufferings of uh, the suffering of other people, when you see uh, the destruction in the world, and you want to stand at the breach, you stand in the gap for for that kind of of community of people, your prayer life will not always be convenient. It will not always be with a smile. So we have to have this kind of balance in how we approach prayer. Of course, God also wants you to be able to laugh with Him and uh and smile with him 
uh, it won't be tears all the time, okay? But I just wanted to make this point clear here, that Jesus knew about supplication. There are, there are some people today who believe that a supplication that is beseeching God, asking earnestly for something, some believers who believe that supplication is not part of the New Testament, uh, and I really find it strange because the Apostle Paul himself talked about with all manner of prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. So there is prayer, and there is another kind of prayer that is also called supplication, meaning confession and just claiming and receiving. It doesn't work for everything. There are things that require another kind of prayer, which is called supplication. Okay, and another thing that I want us to say here, this is just, the Bible says that he offered up these prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Heard here means answered, of course, you know that. And uh, now this is interesting because the Bible says that when Jesus prayed like that, he was heard. In fact, when he stood in the, in the tomb, in front of the tomb of Lazarus, he thanked God and he said, Father, I thank you because you always hear me. So he was heard. He was answered. God gave him what he wanted. And I believe that after God gave him what he wanted, when he said, for example, Father, let this cup be taken away from me. And he really asked for it. He, he besought God for it. Guess what? He was heard. He was answered. <laughs> I believe that Jesus was answered. I believe that Jesus was answered because, well, uh, well, he was answered. And the father said, okay. But then he said to the father, but not my will, but yours be done. Now, now, this, this takes me to something here. I know that actually both the father and the, and the son have the same will. But the, fa but the son on planet earth experienced the realities of being a human being. And uh, his humanity had to struggle. His humanity struggled with some of the things that in his divinity he wouldn't have struggled with. And, uh, and so Jesus' humanity, in his humanity he could feel the pressure, he could feel even the fear, he could feel, you know, all the tension that was involved in going to the cross. He could experience that and he said, Father, please take it away, take it away. And the Father said, okay, I'm taking it away because I can't kill you. I can't send you to the cross if you don't want to go there. And that is why the Bible says, Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me. In fact, not even the Father takes my life from me. I laid down myself. Jesus made this final decision, this final choice. It was a personal something. He did it. He did it. He gave his life. He gave his life. And that is why he is so much in honor. The Father did not give his life. It is Jesus who gave, who gave his life. The Father gave the Son and the Son gave his life. Amen. I mean, as I'm saying this right now, I'm just sensing the presence of God. I just want to praise Jesus for what he did for us. Hallelujah. I, and I, I, hope, I hope you appreciate uh, the magnitude of his sacrifice. Okay, but we have to move. We have to move on. Uh, we have to move on. Now, there's one last thing I want to point out from this scripture. The Bible says he was heard because of his reverent submission. The Bible, uh, in, in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which I like a lot, um, it says he was heard because of his reverence, okay? And uh, I believe the King James says he was heard because of his submission, okay? And, and I, I just want to say this. Jesus had reverence towards the Father. And uh, unfortunately, I have the impression, out of observation, out of observing the church in a, you know, in a long time, I have, the, I have the impression that the more believers think they have knowledge, the less reverent they are towards God. The more believers have the impression that they know Scripture, that they know New Testament realities, that they know, uh, you know, all of these things, and you know that they know the kingdom, that they know the grace of God, that they know all of those stuffs. The more people uh, grow in knowledge the more they lose this reverence towards God. I'm, I'm seeing that, not, I'm not saying it's everybody, of course, you know, I am one of them, I'm one of the people with the knowledge. I, I, I believe I know, I know a few things by the grace of God. But, hey, but it's, it's just a trend that I've observed in many people and, and, I've, and, I'm, and, and I'm really trying to fight this. I'm really trying to help the, our, our people 
to not fall into this trap, into this trap. The Bible says that knowledge puffs up. And it is true. You know, it, it wasn't a suggestion that scripture made. Knowledge does puff up. Knowledge does puff up. In, and this means that if you're not careful, the, when, as you grow in knowledge, you will puff up. You'll get a big head. And I'm seeing this. In fact, I'm seeing even some people who, you know, they are actually still ignorant, but they just discovered a couple of new things. And they think that, well, well, that's the end of the world for them. And uh, so I, I've, be, I've seen believers who come across one truth and they become so irreverent, even towards their leaders, even towards, you know, everybody that they think does, does not know that knowledge. And, and that irreverence even affects their relationship with God because, hey, if you are not reverent, towards human beings that you can see you know towards people who've gone ahead of you if you have if you can show respect i'm seeing a lot of believers being so disrespectful today i mean people are just disrespectful and jesus jesus made a difference he he was reverent in spite of the fact that he was not just a man full of god's word he was the word of god made flesh it is true that in a sense we're also in a sense in a sense we're also the word of god made flesh because we were begotten by the word of God. And right now, the life that we live is no longer uh, as a result of natural birth. It is as a result of spiritual word empowered birth. So we are literally the product of God's word. The, regener the regeneration of our spirit is the product of the word of God. So we are God's seed in Abraham right now. But, but, but Jesus was the, the eternal word, literally made flesh. And uh, he was incarnate. He assumed human nature. And yet he was so reverent to the Father. Jesus was so obedient, so reverent. And I'm like, Father, help me. Spirit of God, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. Help me be this reverent to the Father. Because this is the key to elevation. The Bible says, uh, that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And 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 in Philippians chapter two, uh, the Bible tells us the reason why Jesus was lifted up above every other name, why His name was uh, elevated, exalted above every other name, is because He humbled Himself before the Father. You see, so this reverent submission was a hallmark of Jesus' prayer life, and it was a, it was a secret. It was a key secret weapon that he used and that made him just to be uh beyond compare and um uh, he's still unequaled hallelujah and um uh, but we have to follow that example so his reverence what is this reverence reverence an attitude of humility before god an attitude of humility that says father you are bigger than me what you think is more important than what i think and what you say is more important than what i have to say and what you want, what you want done is more important than, than, than what I want to do. It, it is this kind of reverent attitude, this kind of reverence towards God that says, Father, it is your thought, it's your word, not mine. It is what you think, not what I think. You know, when we get to this place of reverence towards God, we've really uh, achieved a huge milestone in our walk with God. Uh, and and th there's an easy test to this. Every day, even sometimes with simple decisions, sometimes your heart will want to do something, but but you hear the Spirit of God within you telling you to do the exact opposite. Can you obey that? Can you follow that? Reverence means you will be able to say, Lord, you just have your way and I'll follow. Even if, even if it, it, it goes contrary to what I thought I needed. At, at, at this point in time and when you begin to do this after a point in time let me just say this just to help somebody when you begin to 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 practice this kind of reverence this kind of of attitude of humility towards god this kind of obedience towards god this kind of submission towards god when you begin to practice that after some time even your desires become prune you know the bible says that delight thyself in the lord and he will grant you the desires of your heart. Why? Because when you 
have really delighted thyself in him, the desires of your heart becomes his own desires. You begin to desire the same thing that he desires. You begin to think the way he does. And so he will grant that to you. So because God is not saying here, delight yourself in the Lord, and then he will grant you the desires of your heart, including the carnal desires, including the fleshly desires, including desires that are against his will. No, that's not what scripture says. When you delight yourself in him, your heart will be changed and your desires will be, will, will be transformed. And whenever you desire it, in fact, that's the key to fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Learning to yield your heart to him. At one point in time, you will not need to pray again, Father, what's your will for my life? Your desire will be his will. Automatically, because you have trained your heart to delight in him. Your desires automatically uh, begin to synchronize with His will. Amen? Uh, let's move on here. Let's look at another portion of Scripture. Uh, let's read um, Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. I hope you're getting blessed by this. Matthew 14, verse 22 and 23. It says, Immediately Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. He went up on, a mountain, on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when the evening came, he was alone there. Amen? And uh, so uh, one of the things that we learn here is that Jesus enjoyed solitude. Jesus Jesus made provision to be alone. He, uh, he took some measures to be alone. He would move away from the people. He would move away. He would move away. Uh, he would send the multitudes away. It's, it's just as if, you know, a lot of people come to my house to visit and I just say, okay, now you guys have to go away because, because I want to pray. Okay. And uh, a lot of people will even be offended by this kind of behavior nowadays. But if you are going to be a man of God, if you're going to be an exceptional believer, if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to actually live the normal Christian life, a life full of, of, of grace, full of power, full of miracle, full of truth, full of revelation, hey, you need to send people away at times. Some visits have to be shortened. Uh, some appointments have to be canceled at times. And, and this is what Jesus could do. Even in the midst of booming ministry, when you know what people were following him, he would send the multitudes away, and uh, and he would we, withdraw himself. It is important if you don't learn the art of withdrawing yourself. There are lots of things that you will miss out on. Even those who are married, even if you are married, your prayer moments when you are alone with God are more important than your prayer moments when you're praying with your wife or, or, or husband. Even though these other moments also have their importance and they are very powerful. They have their role to play. There is corporate prayer and there is personal prayer. But I always say this, you do not develop a personal relationship in a public place. So no matter how powerful the prayer meeting in church is, no matter how powerful the prayer in the group is, uh, it is powerful and it is fulfilling the purpose that is assigned to it. But in terms of you learning to walk with God as an individual, you need to learn to withdraw yourself. You need to learn to be by yourself. So this one uh, other thing that we can learn from the Lord Jesus here, Jesus withdrew himself. And he, he enjoyed being in a solitary place. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, it says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. So Jesus loved solitude. Solitude is indispensable for intimacy. There cannot be intimacy without solitude. In fact, that is why babies are not made on the streets. Babies are made in a room with two people being in a, in a state of intimacy. Okay, solitude. Solitude is required for intimacy. Solitude is indispensable for intimacy there cannot be intimacy with god if there is not habitual if there is no habitual uh solitude if you don't learn to be alone with god in a, in an habitual consistent manner you cannot enjoy intimacy with god 
Amen. You will not be able to enjoy intimacy with God. And this was the highest priority in Jesus' life. He wanted to be alone with the Father. And uh, another thing that we learn from this Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, it says, And now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. So Jesus, Jesus prayed early in the morning. He loved praying not just in a solitary place, but also in a quiet place. Uh, well, I don't believe that there are any special hours. You know, there are some people who, who teach that there are, any, there are special hours. Well, I'm not exactly sure that is true. I believe that all hours are good because if there are special hours, it means that somebody who has a job that keeps them up, that keeps them working at night, and uh, the only time that they have free is actually by day when everybody else is at work, then if, if there are special hours, if the hours of the night are special in themselves, then it becomes a problem. These people will be at a disadvantage, but nobody is at a disadvantage in the kingdom. Nobody. So all hours are equal. But, I mean, they are equal in, an, in the absolute sense. But looking at our realities, not all hours are equal. Why? Because the hours of the night and very early in the morning, which Jesus enjoyed taking advantage of, these hours are best in, you know, for most people, without being a law, right? But they are best for most people because these are the hours when you can really have uh, the best solitude and, and uh, the deepest silence. Okay? It is great to pray you know, when distractions are not present, the TV is off, uh, there, there are no kids making noise around you and things like that. Even your own children can become a hindrance to your fellowship with God. So sometimes after the prayer with the family, you need to have solitary times of prayer, solitary times of prayer, isolated prayer. And early morning or very late at night sometimes is really the best for most people because those are the times when other people, most other people are, are sleeping and your neighborhood is quiet. There are no longer loud bars making noise around and uh, it's, it's really great. And Jesus practiced this. That was the wisdom that Jesus practiced. And I really see no reason why we shouldn't want to emulate this. Okay. So some people are more of night owls while others are more of day people. So if you are a, a person of the night, use the night hours. If you're a person of the day, you know, rising early morning, you can learn to rise early, early in the morning, very early in the morning and, and, and use these first hours in the morning before you do every other thing. So this is this is very important. I am an I am more of a night person, so I like prolonged nights, you know. But just do whatever it works, whatever works for you, and don't put yourself in the box. Sometimes you won't be able to follow your your night program. Well, you can start early in the morning. So, but make this habitual. Make this habitual. We 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 see in this place here, in uh, Mark one thirty five that Jesus got up long before daylight and this was his habit long before daylight so that could have been 4 a.m that could have been 3 a.m that could have been 2 a.m only god knows the holy spirit was there so we don't know how long before daylight this long before daylight was actually so but the holy spirit knows but but i know that long before daylight is not 30 minutes long before daylight is not one hour long before daylight could have been hours it could have been three hours could have been four hours could have been five hours anything but this also shows me that Jesus believed in spending time. It wasn't a five-minute uh, joint. No, it's not, it's not just a five-minute uh, greeting prayer to the Father. This won't take you anywhere. I don't care how much uh, knowledge you believe you have. And from many of our pulpits, we always hear that length is not, uh, length is not the issue. Uh, well, length may not be the issue, but length is also part of the issue. <laughs> Length is also part of the issue. Learn to spend time. I mean, you can build a great relationship even with a human being, even with your wife, if you only talk with her five minutes once in a while, 10 minutes. No, the ones who spend one hour, two hours of quality time, you know, length is not all there is about it, but length is also a major part of it. In fact, uh, uh, don't be deceived when somebody tells you it's not about the length, but it's about the quality. Hey, guess what? You will not even know good quality in prayer if you don't learn to stay there first. It is when you have learned to spend time in prayer.
that you now know the power of quality prayer. Most people who have never invested in length in prolonged prayer will not be able to enjoy quality in terms of the impact that their prayer can have, even though short. Amen. So we, we shouldn't do this thing. We shouldn't reverse the order of things here. If you if you have not learned to at least spend some time, uh, forget about quality. Your prayers will be shallow. You learn depth by, by staying there, staying there, staying. Jesus told the disciples, tarry, 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 tarry in Jerusalem. Tarry until, until, tarry until. So there are things that will not happen before you tarry. Tarry until something happens. Tarry until you are endued with power. So this is very, 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 very important. This is key. This is pivotal. Okay. So what else? Let's look. Let's 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 read Luke chapter five. In Luke chapter five, the Bible says, uh, verse fifteen to sixteen. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Verse 16, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Okay, so this is about the same message that we just mentioned above. Jesus withdrew, Jesus used to withdraw from the presence of people. In fact, until you are delivered from the presence of people, you cannot be a strong man of the presence of God. The biggest hindrance to the presence of God being manifest in your life is the presence of people. Is the presence of people. This, you know, that is why this is you know, it, this is sometimes such a big challenge for people who are people. People, you know, like me, I'm a I'm a people person. I love people. I I just love people. I, I love people. I love company. I love being with people and things like that. But I have had to severe myself from that because uh, people, the presence of people, can be the biggest hindrance to the presence of of God being manifest in your life. Uh, you already know, for those of you who listened to the previous teachings, you already know that the presence of God is something that is permanent in the life of, of the believer, but it is not manifest in the life of every believer. It is not every believer who experiences the, the manifest presence of God. Okay? Uh, so it's all there. God is always with us, but we're not always aware of that, and it's, all, and it's not always manifest. So deliver yourself from the addiction to the presence of people. Some, 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 of, some people, some of you listening to me are addicted to the presence of people. If you can't spend 24 hours without seeing anybody, sometimes just lock yourself up in your room, somebody. Some, somebody wants to go far with God. Somebody wants to do big things for the kingdom. Sometimes lock yourself up for 24 hours. See no human being. See no human being. See nobody. See nobody for 24 hours. Oh my God, see nobody for 24 hours and let the Father cause his voice to sound over you. When, you. when you lock yourself up like that for 24 hours and you see nobody and you hear the Father tell you, I love you, uh, you, you, you are my beloved. See, this thing will no longer just be scripture written on the pages of your Bible. It will be a personal, it will be such a powerful revelation. And after you've locked yourself up for 24 hours like that, you move out of that place and somebody tells you, I don't like you. It won't mean anything to you because you just heard from the father himself, I love you. So who are you? If you don't like me, and so what? Amen. And, and, and you need to deliver yourself from people and, and become addicted to the presence of God. You need to you need to learn to do that. Okay, so Jesus practiced prolonged prayer. We also see that in uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer. Jesus continued all night in prayer to God. He continued all night in prayer to God. Luke 6, 12. He continued all all night in prayer to God. My God, did he need to pray that 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 way? Well, he did. If he did it, then it was necessary. Amen. And I don't and 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 I refuse to be convinced that I don't need to do the same thing. I refuse to be persuaded that I don't need the same kind of of of, of prolonged sessions with God. Amen. In fact, those are the people who teach believers that 
prolonged prayer is not needed or is not is not necessary uh probably people who who are not, who are not practicing it or they're practicing it but they don't want believers to be where they are i don't know but but really we have to tell it the way it is and the way it is is one hour of prayer is better than five minutes of prayer believe it or not that is a fact that is a fact that is a fact just pray consistently five minutes every day and another person prays consistently one hour every day and uh and, and these two people have the same amount of knowledge, the same revelation, the same everything. But one prays, one takes one hour every day for one for one year to spend with God, and the others with the same exact knowledge spends five minutes every day to be with God. The one who's been spending one hour every day to be with God, with all that, with all that same knowledge, will be far more advanced after a year. Far more. There will be nowhere, no way to compare the two. He, there will be no comparison possible between this one who's been consistently, habitually praying for one hour every day with all the rimas and the other one who has had all the rimas but was only spending five minutes a day. Just try that. And if you want to be the one in the five minutes club, well, you can try that. You can try that. You can try that. Be in that club. Be in the five minute club. Be in the five minute club. Jesus practiced prolonged prayer you need to keep that in mind now uh the next scripture that we're going to use here is uh matthew 26 verse 44 now i want you to get this one very this one is very important jesus practiced the principle of praying thrice three times jesus practiced the principle of praying three times the bible says in matthew 26 44 and he left them again and went away and prayed a third time saying again the same words now praying thrice is a spiritual principle not in the number of prayer itself but in the persistence of prayer the principle of praying thrice doesn't mean three times like one two three necessarily of course it could be that but it means that until you get the burden discharged in your spirit you have to continue praying Learn to pray until the burden has been discharged, until the burden is lifted up. If, if you begin to pray for a matter, learn to continue to pray for that until the burden is lifted up. Jesus, the Bible says he prayed a third time, saying the same words, meaning he prayed for the same thing a third time. He prayed for the same thing a third time. Now listen. In Colossians, in First, in Second Corinthians, chapter twelve and verse eight, we hear we learn the same thing from the Apostle Paul concerning this thing, talking about the thorn in the flesh that he asked God to take away. He said, "Concerning this thing, I besought the Lord three times that I that it might depart from me." Second Corinthians twelve eight, Second Corinthians. He says, "I asked God three times to remove this thing, but the, but the Father said, well, my grace is sufficient.' So, in other words, the Father said, "Okay, you leave that thing." Let me discharge this burden to you. My grace is sufficient. So God gave him an answer. It may not have been the answer that he was expecting, but God gave him an answer and said, okay, you forget about this thing because my grace is sufficient for you. And uh, in Daniel chapter 13, the Bible says that Daniel, one of the Judean exiles, has ignored you, the king, and the edict you signed. For he prays three times a day. Now, this is not exactly the same thing here, but there's a principle here. There's a principle three times. So it, it talks about the repetition of your prayer moments, the repetitions. You see, Jesus went again and prayed the third time. Even when he, he, he was with the disciples, he first went, had a prayer session. He came back later and he said, okay, how, you guys can't even watch and tarry with me for one hour. And then he went again and then he came back, he met them sleeping again. And then he went a third time and prayed the same prayer. So what? what Oh my God, what if you prayed in the morning and then in the afternoon you find you found some time to pray again? And then early in the evening you found some time to pray again. And then early and, and, and then later in the evening you found some time to pray again. Sometimes it may not be a request. Even just your worship, just your consecration, just your 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 exchange with God. There is power in repeating your prayer moments. There is power. There is power. This was the power of Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth is a man who said, I have never prayed for more than 30 minutes. But he didn't just leave it there. He said, I've never prayed for more than 30 minutes. But then he said, I have never spent 
more than 30 minutes without praying. This man was in a constant flow of the manifest presence of God, a constant flow of miracles and, and of manifestations. And the power of God was flowing in his, from his life like crazy. And his secret was repetition of prayer moments. He's, he said, instead of just praying four hours in the morning and then I, I stay like that the rest of the day, he said, I'd rather split my four hours into four sessions of one hour each or into eight sessions of, of 30 minutes each. I'm not saying that that's what he said, but that is the principle that he used. He said, I have not prayed as far as Smith Wigglesworth was concerned. He said, I've, not, I've never prayed. Uh, I, I do not spend more than 30 minutes in prayer, but I do not spend more than 30 minutes without praying. So Smith Wiggles' word, no matter what he was doing, no matter who he was, be it a queen, be it a prince, be it another man of God, be it a visitor, when you come to uh, uh when you come into Smith Wiggles' word's presence, uh and you've been with him for 25 minutes, when it's almost 30 minutes, he will say, Okay, let's pause it here and let's pray. And he would pray, he would not allow anything to interrupt this kind of you know this kind of prayer it was not just praying in his heart and things like that no praying taking a solitary moment or, or going on his knees or just doing something i mean brain brain of course somebody who's going to school you know and you have classes that last for hours and you you can't do this because you won't get up from from the class and say okay well let me go to the bathroom or, or to the, uh, yeah, let me go to the restroom in the university campus. And, and I just spend 30 minutes there and I come back for the class. You will have missed a lot of things. So this formula may not work for people who have jobs, for people who have, um, you know. But after you have prayed in the morning when you left your house, you can take out some, some, some time again in the afternoon and pray. And if that is really not possible, well, if you think it's not possible, at least you can pray again in the evening. But what is the secret here? Try to pray more than once in a day. Try. Try. It's not a rule. It's not a law. But it's really uh, a, a spiritual principle. This, the principle of repetition. Jesus did not just pray once a day. And in fact, it is when you, I have discovered in my own uh, walk with God that the times that, the days that I succeed in multiplying my prayer moments those days I am more aware, I have a greater awareness of the presence of God. Maybe you prayed in the morning and everything just felt, well, Well, anyway, you prayed by faith. The just shall live by faith. Everything just felt so dry and things like that. You don't, we don't go by feelings anyway. But again, I, but I, I have discovered and I dare somebody to try this. After you've spent some time in the morning, spend some time again with God alone in the afternoon. And spend some time again, you know, maybe in the evening. And uh if I try to have four, three, four, five sessions of prayer in a day, now the, the one in the morning or the one in the evening may be longer. It, it, I'm not saying that all of these have to, to be the same length, depend, depending on how your day is and depending on, on your own level of thirst for God. But just try this principle of multiplying sometimes in the office during that break or while you go to the, uh, or, or, or when you go to the restroom. My God, you can take 10 minutes and just pray in the Holy Ghost with all your heart, with all your being. I'm, I'm telling you, or just begin to praise God and, and sing songs of, of, of worship unto Him. I am telling you, when you learn to multiply these encounters with God, these, these prayer moments, you become more aware of the presence of God. And before you realize it, you begin to have some experiences you were not having before. Let me say here, finally, Jesus had supernatural manifestations and encounter during prayer. You know, during uh, he had supernatural manifestations and encounters with God. In Luke chapter 9, verse 28, it says, About eight days after these words, he took along Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he was praying, verse 29, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. The appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. So I just want to, I just want to close with this. Jesus prayed and his face changed. Jesus prayed and his face changed. Jesus prayed 
and his face changed. Jesus had a prayer life that was so effective and efficient and powerful that it brought him experiences with the power and presence of God. If your prayer life is really what it can be, if, if your prayer life is really what it is supposed to be, it is going to open you up for experiences with God. Now, these experiences will take many forms, many shapes. But any prayer life that does not yield experiences with God is not an effective prayer life. By experiences with God, I'm not just saying that you will see some things, you know, or that you will have some things appear in your room that God will reveal himself, you know, visibly, tangibly to you. You know, I'm not saying that even though it is this, uh, all of that is part of what I'm saying. But sometimes you may not even have spectacular experiences as an individual. I personally have, I have not had some, I've not had too many spectacular experiences. I've had a, a few of them, but I've not had too many. I know of people who have crazy experiences all the time with, you know, crazy visions all the time and things like that. I've, I have not had too many spectacular uh, experiences with God, but the experiences with God that I'm talking about are not just the ones that you have in your room while you're praying. You may think you've not had any experience with God, but then when you go out, you speak a word to somebody or God gives you a word of knowledge. It, it, he, he gives you a word of prophecy. He gives you a word that will bless somebody. He gives you a discernment. You see something. You, 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 can, you have an ability to discern the spirit. You just discover that maybe some gifts of the spirit are beginning to, to manifest in you. You, be, you. you discover that things that were not happening with you before begin to happen. So when I talk about these experiences, I'm also including that, okay? Jesus may not appear to you physically in your room, but when you preach him, people see him, you see? So what I'm saying is Jesus' prayer life brought about experiences to him. What experiences has, the prayer, has your prayer life so far brought to you? Has your prayer life brought healing the sick to you? You may not have seen God physically. You may not have had some... Uh, crazy personal experiences like some people may have so far but when you lay hands you see people being healed in fact i i prefer that kind of experience than the one i have in my room why because this experience is visible and it helps somebody else as well do you hear what i'm saying uh, so so what has your prayer life produced what what experiences has it brought to you have you have you had experiences you know i'm not just talking about spiritual gifts here have you had an experience where you, you, you went for an exam and uh, you saw all the questions the day before in a dream and you went to the exam in the examination hall or you saw all the questions after you had had some great time of prayer with the, with the Father and you went into the examination hall and you, you, you met all those same questions on the table or you did not even see the questions but you just discovered that while you were in the examination hall, while you were writing your exam, you just sensed some spiritual force and some spirit, some supernatural power that began to be at work in you. And you could reply, you could answer those questions with wisdom that you knew was not your, was not your natural wisdom. What experience have you had from your prayer life? If your prayer life has not produced any experiences with God yet, both internal experiences and external experiences. If your prayer life has never produced experiences with God for you, I am afraid you have not started yet. And, and, and this series and this message today, as I close, is an invitation for you to start. To start a fresh, brand new prayer life. A fresh, brand new life of adventure with God. A life... Because prayer is adventurous. I, I love the, it's, an, it's a beautiful adventure. It's a beautiful adventure. It will turn your life on earth into an adventure with God. You are in an adventure. Oh, I, I personally like adventure. I like hiking. I like climbing mountains. I like all kinds. I like traveling. I like seeing new places. And this is what, and it, it, this is what a living prayer life will do. A living prayer life. And from the experience of Jesus, from all the things that we that we read, all the scriptures that we read that refer to his prayer life, we, we have seen that this is this was Jesus' story. His prayer life produced an unbelievable number of miracles. It produced an unbelievable number of encounters with God. He 
He, his prayer life produced encounters with God for other people. Other people met God, met the Father through him. How many people have, I mean, how many people are encountering God through you? So your prayer life must produce as from today in the name of Jesus. So I hope you've been blessed by this session. Oh my God, it's been far longer than we uh, expected, but I believe this was necessary. And uh, may the grace of the Father, may the grace of our Lord be multiplied unto you. And let the spirit of prayer, let the spirit of prayer come upon us. Let the spirit of prayer come upon this family. Let the spirit of prayer be upon us. Let the spirit of prayer be upon me speaking to you. Let the spirit of prayer be upon everybody. May we enjoy the presence of God. May we love praying. And, and as you listen to this, let the spirit of God minister to you. Some of you have to let go of some things. Some of you have to forsake some things. Some of you have to abandon some things that have been standing as hindrances to your prayer life. I believe the Holy Spirit is telling you, let go of this. Let go, let go, let go, let go so that you can be with me, so that you can. I have so much to show you. I have so, so much to share with you. I have so much to, to impart. I have so much to use you to do in other people's life. There's, there's so much I want to touch lives with through you. But I want you to just come and be with me. That's, that's the word of the Spirit of God to somebody. And, uh, and I pray that we all receive the grace to, to respond positively to this call. 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 To this call.